That's exactly how I came to lose the chance, the chance to win head is, head is hard. Who says was not frustrating and doesn't tear you apart? Hello, everyone. This is Georgiana Adams, and I'm very excited for today's faculty focus interview. This faculty member holds a very dear place to my heart because he is my voice teacher here at DePaul, and I have been able to study with him for three years now. Please help me in giving a warm welcome to Professor Jeff Ray. Hi, Jeff. How are you? Good, Georgie. I'm great. This is so wonderful to be able to talk to yeah. you. How are you? Good. I'm doing well, you know. Good. You have been teaching at DePaul for a couple years now, so we're really excited to, you know, get your insight and talk to you about um, your experiences here at DePaul. Thank you. Oh, well, and and thank you for that introduction. That was <laughs> so kind. Yeah, of it's a, it, to, to be able to teach students like you, to be able to teach you is a joy and is You're absolutely so an honor for me. So thank you. Thank you. So, you know, one of my first questions for you, and um, I think we've been asking a lot of faculty members this, is, you know, um, a lot of people have different paths to get to music. Um, I know mine wasn't, was more conventional. I, you know, I grew up really um, loving music. I didn't have music parents, but, you know, that was my passion. But growing up, what influence did you have, um, different influences for you that helped you get to the path of music? What a great question. Um, you know, music in my life was a constant. It was there from my earliest memory. Um, I grew up in the United Methodist Church and my mother sang in the choir every Sunday. Uh, my sisters and I am the youngest. Uh, we all sang in the children's choir. And so my memories, even as a you know, grade school, was going to church on a Wednesday evening to rehearse with the children's choir. And then the adult choir would rehearse afterwards. And my friends and I, whose parents were singing in the adult choir, were always hanging around afterward. And so we got to, you know, we were supposed to be doing homework, but we would, um, we would, you know, get into mischief in the church, but we always found ourselves gravitating towards the sanctuary where they were rehearsing and we'd sit in the sanctuary and listen to this gorgeous music and it was it was so you know at the time we didn't know it was influencing us but I, I think it really did have an influence um my dad didn't sing in the choir but my dad always loved music so for my dad it was country and we took a lot of long trips and whenever we were in dad's car we listened to country and to this day, I still do. I mean, uh, it's one of my guilty pleasures. I absolutely love it. Uh, and, and my kids love it. And my family loves it. Um, so it, it was always a constant. I wanted, to study a, I wanted to study an instrument from day one. In fact, my sister, who's a couple of years older, started studying flute. And I would get you know, brought along to her lessons. And her flute teacher also taught several other instruments and amongst them were the drums. So here I am at five years old, sitting, you know, basically in the waiting room in his basement and I see this drum set and I'm begging my mother to play the drums. And so she signed me up for drum lessons and I started drum lessons, but I wanted the trap set. I wanted, you know, the bells and whistles. My dad built out of a piece of plywood and rubber. A, a, a drum set, basically just a pad. Well, to me, that didn't interest me. So I lost interest pretty quickly. And the next thing was the violin, which turned to the viola, uh, which sort of gravitated into, you know, more choirs and more singing. So. Yeah, I love that you bring up that, um, you know, your parents' music influenced you. I feel like that's so true. I mean, especially being in the car with them, when right from when you're young, you're listening to their music. I know, like, I find comfort in 
80s music because my parents would <laughs> listen to it all the time in the car, you know? So that's so important. Um, and that's so wonderful. So now after you did, um, after you played the drums and the viola, did you, um, what helped you decide that you wanted to make music your career path or was that originally your plan? Was it my plan? I, I think I always knew music was going to be a part of my life somehow. I didn't know quite how. Um, in high school, I found that uh, when I sang, people paid attention to me. When I sang, I, I got uh, favorable responses from people. And I loved that. Uh, and so singing in choir was really important to me in high school. And acting in shows was very important to me in high school. And I had um, the good fortune of having friends who were older than me who had successes in theater and in Broadway. And so they sort of showed me that it was possible. Um, but when I left high school, I, I wasn't sure. So um, it was sort of happenstance that I found my way to DePaul. Uh, I had a, a good friend uh, and she was studying with Ann Perillo, who later became my voice teacher at DePaul and mentor and uh, taught me so much and, and showed me generosity uh, that I try and, and, and pass on to my own students. Um, but I came to visit her on campus and met Anne and, and went to some concerts at DePaul and found that this is a place I think I wanna be. And so I auditioned, came to DePaul, started my, uh, schooling at DePaul, but it wasn't over yet and it wasn't a sealed deal yet. So uh, I spent one year as a music student and thought, well, I, I, maybe I should be responsible. So I transferred to the business school and spent a year uh, as a business major at DePaul and took my accounting classes and my marketing classes and um, all of those that were going to make me a successful businessman. But at the same time, I was getting cast in shows. So that was Harry Silverstein's first year at DePaul. And as a business major, I was cast as the understudy for Figaro. So I was there at rehearsals all night. And, and you know, of course, we, we would have fun. We'd go out after rehearsals. And then I'd have an 8.30 in the morning accounting class that wasn't as interesting as the music I was studying and singing. So uh, pretty soon that changed. I had been cast in a couple other shows that were uh, semi-professional shows and I was getting paid to do it. And I thought, well, if I'm getting paid to do this and I love to do it, I think I need to explore it further. I came back to DePaul and you couldn't stop me. I was, I was gonna finish and I, was, and I started this, um, this path that, that didn't stop. I knew where I was going. That's so wonderful. I remember hearing that story in studio my freshman year, and it really, I don't know if I ever told you this, but I at the time was actually kind of questioning music myself, and that really inspired me, and it actually is one of the reasons that helped me stay in music school and, you know, kind of wow. see this through. Yeah, that wow. story. Yeah. Yeah, so you, even before I started studying with you, you really had an influence on me. Oh. Um so, you know, so you knew that DePaul was um, the place to be. You knew you were studying music. So then going on to higher education, going on to graduate school, how did you know what you wanted to do after your undergraduate work? Well, so once I, ba once I decided to come back to music school and pursue the degree, um, I started I started to see this vision forward. And the vision to me was, what would my next step be? I knew I wanted to perform. I, I knew at one point I would teach. I, I guess I knew it deep down, but I, I wasn't planning to teach. I didn't feel as though coming out of, uh, coming out of school that I would have enough to offer. So I wanted to perform. And my goal then was what would the next step be for me from, from undergrad? And, you know, I had colleagues again who showed me that there was a path from DePaul to the Ryan Opera Center at the time was the Lyric Opera Center for American Artists. 
Um, I had friends who showed me that from taking classes at DePaul, there was a path to Broadway. There was a path to London. There was, right? So these opportunities, these possibilities were there. There's a, a terrific quote, and I don't quote a lot, but there's a great quote by Abe Lincoln um, that says, you know, that some achieve success is proof to all that anyone can achieve success, you know? Um, and th I guess that really is, is something that, I, that, that is true to me because I had seen friends who had success. It showed me, first of all, to be so happy for their success and, and then that it's possible. So I began to create this, um, this plan for myself. And I knew I wanted to come back. I knew I wanted to be in the opera center at Lyric and I wanted to find a way to get there but I knew it might not happen right away. So I auditioned for grad schools and, and wound up being accepted to Manhattan School of Music and went out to study at Manhattan. Well, at the same time, I had auditioned for the Opera Center at Lyric my senior year at DePaul, but never heard anything back. So I thought, well, okay, I'll go out and do my master's program at Manhattan School. And after I finish that, I'll audition again and I'll come back to Lyric. My whole focus of going to Manhattan was to get me to the next step professionally. And I moved out and I was living in my apartment in New York. And um, because I had never heard, I called Andrew Foley, who was the head of the, the opera center at Lyric to say, you know, I never received any letter. Did my, did my materials fall through the gap? And he rustled with some papers a second and he came back and he said, you never heard from us. And I said, no, I never heard. And he said, we, we want you to be a part of the program. We want you to be in, they were doing a, a, a premiere of a piece by Bruce Saylor, who was a wonderful American composer. Uh, and it was Orpheus Descending. And he said, we want you to have a role in this. And so I spent my first year at Manhattan School traveling back and forth to Chicago to, to do readings and, and recordings and rehearsals for Orpheus Descending while I was working on my master's degree. And in that time, uh, I auditioned again. And I was also, because I, was, I, because I had this, uh, this role, I, I got to have coachings with the coaches at Lyric. So Tim Shaneland and Phil Moorhead and Richard Boldry and Donna Brunsma, all of these coaches that have now become, you know, some of them have passed away. Donna has passed away, but, but good friends and, and mentors and, and influences in my life that helped me to progress as an artist. And I was accepted the next year, which kind of just kept the roll, ball rolling. And so I didn't even finish my master's degree at Manhattan. I came back, started the program as an official member and went on from there. That's so wonderful. So now, I mean, there are quite a few um, Ryan Opera Center um, graduates that are teaching at DePaul in the voice program right now. Can you talk a little bit on that experience? I know you did talk about those coaches a little bit, but then once you did get in the center, how was that experience? And, you know, um, and how did that shape you as an artist? Huh. I it, I think it had immeasurable uh, shape on me, influence on me as an artist. Um, you know, before I came to DePaul, I didn't, I didn't know opera. I knew, I knew country music, I knew church music, I knew choral music, and I knew orchestral music, um, and I knew jazz music, uh, but I didn't know opera. So one of the great things that Ann Perillo did for me when she introduced me to Lyric, she gave me tickets to go see Don Giovanni at Lyric my freshman year. And I sat in the orchestra, I sat in the audience and I looked onto the stage and there's Sam Raimi and Claudio Desderi singing Giovanni in Leporello. And I'm thinking, okay, this I could do. This could be me. And the neat thing about my time at Lyric was that I, I was able to coach with such wonderful coaches and get such terrific career advice 
but I was also able to be on the stage with singers like Sam Raimi, with singers like Dmitry Hvorostovsky, who I was able to cover in, in Faust. And, and, and I got to experience how they worked. And I got to see them succeed. And I also got to see some artists who, who struggled a little bit. And I learned about preparation and the importance of preparation. Um, but we worked on you know, everything from the Ghosts of Versailles uh, to Faust, to the Magic Flute with the great August Everding who, who directed it, um, to uh, Andrea Chenier. And, and so all of these wonderful operas, being able to be on stage with these artists who are making it their career and not only listen and see, but feel from, uh, sort of feel the vibrations on the stage with you. Uh, it had an immense influence on me. Um, and it showed me that there were possibilities uh, for a career that that were beyond the shores of, of our nation, right? So that showed me that, okay, so there's possibilities to move to Europe and have a career in Europe. And, uh, and that was kind of where I took the next step. So um, I think for all of us, it's so neat as a faculty member to look around at my colleagues and know that we all shared these experiences at Lyric. Um, I was able to perform on the stage at Lyric and, and in performances with Kim Jones, who's one of our wonderful colleagues. Uh, and then in you know performances outside of Lyric with Scott Ramsey and with Stacey Tappan, we performed together. Um, and, and so it's so neat. And I know that many of, of my colleagues also perform with, with one another. And I think it's knowing that we all share this wonderful experience we bring it to um, we bring it to DePaul. One of the things that that as I was at Lyric, my own colleagues and and people who had come from elsewhere always felt like Lyric was it had a different it had a different vibe from other companies. Uh, it was very much a family, very much a, a warm place where you walked into the rehearsal department and you knew everybody and everybody was smiling and everybody was happy to see you and and. Somehow I feel like we have brought that to DePaul. So for me, DePaul was always home. It was an easy choice. It was where I, uh, my start began. It was where I found my love for opera and classical music. But now I have all of these wonderful colleagues around me and we all have this same feeling of, of joy and warmth and excitement to share with our students. And I can't help but think that so much of that comes from, you know, Andy Foldy and Richard Perlman and, and Irene Monet and Dan Novak and, and John Rolandi and everybody at Lyric who have been such influencers on our lives. you went on performing and um what helped you kind of realize that you wanted to become a voice teacher or did you you know you mm. said you had that idea um you always kind of had the idea that you were going to teach what kind of um brought that start for you so I did I always knew at some point that I would teach um I always I I, I always felt that I wanted to pass on what I had learned but I wanted to have those experiences to pass on first. Um, the, the transition from performing to teaching for me was, um, happened about 20 years ago. And the other thing that happened about 20 years ago was 9-11. And so uh, I was traveling back and forth to Germany and France and, uh, I was I was singing over there. I was singing over here, and I was supposed to get on a plane that morning. And I was we had a, a young son who was uh, we had just moved into a new house, and uh, we were getting up. We we're going to take him for a walk, and I turned on the TV and I saw what was going on, and I thought it hit everyone to such an extent. But as the days passed. 
and I had to get on planes and I had to fly and I had to travel. And I thought, you know, with my family, I want to, I want to be a part of my family. And, and so my family had a big influence on my deciding to scale back my performances and to teach more. Um, a, a story that is much lighter than that was when our second child was born, Isabella. Uh, she was, um, you know, she was, she was, well, I guess it was actually before Bella was born. So I was in Berlin. I'm performing. My wife's at home, pregnant with a child and with one child in a crib. Okay. So at the time, it was kind of new technology to have these video monitors. So Christopher, our oldest, is in the crib. She puts him to bed. So it's like midnight here. Uh, she's putting him back to bed and it's seven o'clock in the morning, or maybe it was five o'clock in the morning and 10 o'clock. I don't know. But so she's putting him to bed. He doesn't want to go to bed. So he's throwing everything out of his crib and he's getting upset. She's watching this all on the video, right? So she sees on the video him sort of take a running start as much as you can in the crib. And then she doesn't see him. And then she hears this slam and a cry that just bursts out. So she runs in. Well, our son had jumped out of the crib. It's enough to worry anybody. But as she's in there, she's crying and he looks at her and he starts laughing because she thinks that she's laughing. Well, I'm seven hours away. So I get this phone call that wakes me up and I'm rushing, my, rubbing my eyes. And she's saying, he thought I was laughing. And, and, and so I hear this whole thing, but I'm seven hours away. And I thought, you know, I, I want to be more a part of my kids' lives. And so I started at that point was about uh, I started at that point to kind of scale back with my manager and we we accepted things that we wanted to accept and not things that we didn't and and um and I I I was offered a position by a good friend of mine at North Park University and so I started teaching there and I started teaching some students at home and I had done uh master classes when I had been at regional companies where we would go out to either the universities that were there or high schools and, and sing concerts and outreach. And, and I enjoyed it. I, I felt like I could speak to these students and share. And so it just seemed to be at that point, a natural transition. Uh, and then it got more important and uh, more important. It, it became more a part of my days where I had, I, I, I had more students and I was teaching uh, at North Park and at, uh, and at a, a school in Joliet. And, and then I started teaching at University of Chicago. And then lo and behold, I get this phone call from Ross Beecraft that there's a position at DePaul, would you be interested? And I was so humbled and so excited to come home, basically. So how do you balance that family and career at the same time? Mm, now that's that's a million dollar question and I wish I could I wish I could give you an answer that that uh, it works for everyone and um, there are things that, that I've done that I wish I could have done better you know um, the balance is is a constant you always work at um, I think it's staying humble and I think at staying involved and it takes not only uh, the work of you, the performer, or you, the professor, you, the singer. It's it's a it's a group project um, with you know both spouses, and it takes really special people um, it, to be to be in this business and to be married. It's um, you know one thing Anne told me uh, when I was studying with her was you're always a singer. You, that's part of who you are. You're a singer, but you're also, I'm a husband, right? She was a wife um, and, and I'm a son and I'm a brother and I'm a friend. And, and all of these things, it, it just takes being honest with people, I think. Um, and, and there were times when opportunities would come along and I would look at those opportunities and I would say, well, okay, so this would be terrific. I would really enjoy it. But, but what am I giving up to take that opportunity? Um, and I was fortunate. I was fortunate because of the path that I was able to walk that 
I got to be a, um, I got to be a coach for my son's baseball and basketball teams. Uh, I get to watch my daughters play volleyball. Um, they both love it and I love watching them, you know? So, um, I have, you know, a lot of colleagues who've missed those opportunities being gone, but the opportunities that they have had have been immeasurable in other ways. So it takes um, compromise and sacrifice and it takes honesty and humility and um, above everything, it takes love, right? So. Thank you so much for speaking on that. Yeah, that's, and it's so wonderful to know that our faculty are able to do that and to have families and be able to teach and, you know, have a family still. And it's so wonderful. Um, so thank you for speaking on that. So now um, you implement um, your pedagogical knowledge a lot in lessons and in master classes, studio classes, and um, have taught pedagogy classes, vocal ped classes before, what made you want to explore the pedagogy side of singing and teaching? Hmm. Uh, I, when I was in school, when I was at, in your place, I wasn't interested in pedagogy, to be honest. I wasn't, um, I, I took a vocal pedagogy at DePaul and uh, it wasn't, it wasn't anything to me, like what pedagogy is now. Um, I, I wasn't interested in reading about it, but as I started to teach and made that transition, I had, um, I had the great fortune of having the coach that played for me and coached me in undergrad came and accompanied my studio at North Park. And uh, George Tenegal was his name. George passed away a year ago, unfortunately. But George was um, another one of those wonderful influences in my life. And George said to me one day, he says, you know, you, you have this wonderful ability to explain things to students. And, I, and I, I was really touched by that. But when there were things that I couldn't explain, I, I wanted to figure out how. I wanted to learn how. And so um, Karen Bauer, who was the head of the department at North Park at, uh, at the time, and this is probably 15 years ago, uh, passed along to me a, the book of uh, uh, McKinney, which I've, we've used in uh, vocal pad, and I know that Chuck uses now in vocal pad. And I started to read that book and, I, and I, all of these questions came up and I thought, wow, okay, this is really interesting. And I, and I read it. And then I picked up another one and I started to read that. And then I picked up another one and I started to read that. And I read a lot of Richard Miller book. And I, and I read the Venard book and, and all of these things kept filling me with this information. And I started to keep these notebooks of, of what I had read. And several years ago, I read, a, I also read another quote that said, um, if you read five books a year, or there's a five books a year on something pretty soon you become pretty knowledgeable in what you're reading those books on. And so I kept picking up a book on pedagogy and I would add that to my um, reading material. My, you know, growing up, I had a dad who um, was always reading something. He loved history. And so he was always reading books about, um, about the Wild West. He was always, always reading books about the 19th century American history. And when he didn't understand something, he would find a book that would help him understand it. And as a kid, I wasn't interested in reading, but as an adult now, I'm never without a book sitting next to my place. And sometimes it's like two or three books. There's a ped book, there's a, a history book, and there's, you know, maybe a fiction book that's, that's interesting to me at the time. So um, I started reading these and I found that I had a passion for for pedagogy too. And, and it's helped me, I think, I hope, to explain things to students in ways that, uh, in different ways, so that it's understandable. What is the favorite role that you have performed before and why? Mm -hmm. So Giovanni was pretty cool. I enjoyed playing that role. I've done it a, a couple of times. And why? 
Well, first of all, he's the title character, right? And he gets to do just about whatever he wants on stage. He's a lech. He's, um, I hope he's not like me at all. <laughs> he's, uh, but, but he's so much fun. And Mozart wrote such brilliant music for him to sing. Um, the other would have been Marcello, getting the opportunity to sing Marcello uh, several times. Again, Puccini wrote such beautiful, heartfelt, meaningful music for him to sing and, and fun music. And, and again, it's one of those roles that as a student, I got to experience in performance. Um, I played Schonard in DePa at DePaul when we, did the, when we did it. And Steve Powell was the Marcello, fantastic colleague, fantastic singer. And I learned a lot from watching Steve sing it. Um, and then I went on and sang it in Europe and I sang it here. And, and I, I think I carried a lot of what I heard from my favorite singers, uh, Ettore Bastianini uh, singing Marcello, Steve singing Marcello and put that into those roles. And it was, I guess, one of those, you know, coming from a student, looking at a professional world, if I've sung Marcello, that's what I wanted to do, you know? Um, and, and again, with that great music and the and the great camaraderie of the of the of the friends in 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 the opera and the um, turbulent you know romance that Musetta and Marcello have, um, it's it's just so real. Just for fun, what is um, maybe one of your favorite non classical genres, or even if you have a favorite. Um, non-classical song that you'd like to share with us? <laughs> so growing up, my musical tastes were so broad. And I think that that's part of what sent me on this path. They were so broad and opera wasn't part of them, which is, as I think back, amazes me that that's where I, I found my path. But, um, you know, so there's there's country music and and I can listen to I have a I have a couple different playlists on country music that I have on Spotify and and if I'm out in the yard or if I'm driving it's summer it's summer drives right and it's everything from the Zach Brown band going back to uh, to songs that my dad loved like the um, the oh god what were they um, well like Tex Ritter and Roy Rogers, right? And so I love those. Um, but for me, honestly, growing up, I was a kid of the 70s and the 80s. So heavy metal was, um, embarrassed to say, was where I was at. Um, and so I have, I have another playlist that, um, that is all of my 80s and 70s favorites, right? Um, I had a conversation with friends one time. They're like, so what would you do if you were going to, if, if you were going to go to a karaoke bar, what would you sing? Hands down, it's Turn the Page by Bob Seger. To me, that is, um, that's one of those songs that, I, I don't know, he's that gravelly voice that he has, which is so different than, than anything that's classical, but has so much emotion in it. Uh, and and the poetry that is the texts to these songs, to me is is so interesting, you know. So um, I mean, if I in my in my next life, if I get to come back as a um, as not a classical musician but as a pop musician, um, I I told somebody early on in my career, I divulged a. Um, the desire that I had when I was in high school, which was to be the next David Lee Roth. David Lee Roth was the lead singer of Van Halen, right? Absolutely the opposite end of what I am. But um, it's so much fun. I mean, he was such a showman. And absolutely, every time he opened his mouth to sing, you could hear somebody who was having a good time. Perhaps too much of a good time, but a good time. Um, to come back and sing something like Bob Seger to me would be oh, just just so much fun. Um, 
The Doors is another band that I grew up listening to. And, and I had friends and we would kind of joke around and, and mess around in a band and, and sing Doors hits, you know? Um, so there's so much of that stuff that if I could, I would. <laughs> the work and prayers of centuries have brought us to this day. What shall be our legacy? What will our children say? Let them say. Speaking about COVID and, you know, everything that's been going on, besides, you know, obviously music and teaching and other things, what has been keeping you busy right now um, without, you know, having being able to go outside and go to these performances? What have you been doing to kind of entertain? So... So I read a lot. Um, I'm always reading a book, as I mentioned earlier. Um, a year ago, we got a new puppy. So uh, we, um, our puppy, is, uh, who is now a little over a year old, is Adrian Balboa Ray. Of course, she's a boxer, and we call her Addie. And so when COVID, when we all were, were thrust back into our homes and, and couldn't leave and my kids came home from college and, and we were all together, we of course had to get outside somehow. So we started taking walks and they became our COVID walks. And we all joked about uh, our dog loving phase one more than anything because phase one was when everybody was home and everybody could take Addie for a walk. And it was when Addie finally lost her crate because there was no reason for her to go on a crate because there was always somebody home. Well, the COVID walks that started with everybody, big family walks, got longer and longer throughout the summer. And as we moved away from phase one and everybody got more busy, the amount of people on those walks became fewer. And now those walks are essentially Addie and, and myself. But uh, I still love them. We go out, you know, and we'll take our walk at dusk and we'll take our walk. It's, now it's after dark when I finish teaching, but we'll take our walk and just, you know, it's quiet and you can hear the wind and you can, and, and you can see the stars now, you know, but it's just, to me, it's such an opportunity to, to find that peace and that quiet and, and we're dog people. So, you know, training her and, and spending time with her is, is just the most fun. Yes, I, I've seen so many things. People have been saying that dogs love the fact that yeah. we're, we're at a stay-at-home order, you know? Um, my dog loved it as well, you know? We took him on so many walks as well. So, yeah, dogs were loving it for sure. <laughs> and first, I, so, Sorry, yeah. at, at first we were all kind of taking her on walks at different points in the day and I was running with her. And, and there was one point where we laughed. We're like, she's exhausted, because all she does is she comes home for a walk and somebody else takes her for a walk. Yeah. So we finally got to the point where we said, all right, let's just all go together. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. And it's a good, you know, way to bond with family as well. Yeah. We're all together going on this walk together, yeah. but it's a good time. Yeah. I joked with someone that we should do um, like pets of the voice program and, <laughs> you know, cause um, all, I've been asking faculty members about their pets. I know Dr. Chandler has been spending time with his dog as well. So, yeah. you know, that's what you got to do. And I think that this time of not being able to do much has really helped us learn a lot, not only about ourselves, but about the music that we're making and the fact that so many new ideas have come about in this time is really inspiring. And I think, you know, it was at the beginning when all this started, I was, I think most people were a little discouraged. And um, the fact that, you know, DePaul was on top of it and the school music was on top of it and said, you know, we're going to find you a way to do in-person lessons. We're going to find a way to help you get into the practice rooms again was so inspiring. It helped bring that sense of joy back when I think so many people were getting so discouraged about just the world and where we were at. And I think that was such um, just a spark of hope and joy that I was able to do something normal again, go back to the practice rooms, 
do a lesson with you in as in person as we can be, you know? Right. Yeah. And I am so thankful for that. Truly. It, it was hard, you know, March and April were, um, it, it, to see where we were at that time and to not know when we would be able to come back was you're right. And I think it, it affected many people in ways, you know, I've, I've had students, I've had colleagues, you know, family members who've said, I can't, I couldn't sing. It was hard to open my mouth and sing, but what we were able to do, we never stopped really. We took two weeks off and then we resumed those lessons by a zoom and that fed me as a professor and that fed me as a singer to hear you all and to hear the passion that you were putting into your music in those lessons. And it kept me singing and recording things for friends and, 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 and finding ways that I could sing. But still, we were in our own homes singing for a computer screen. And then to be able to resume lessons on the, you know, in, in the concert halls, in the opera hall at DePaul, as a student, to have been able to do that, I would have, uh, that would have been the greatest luxury. So for DePaul to give us this opportunity and to give you all the opportunity to, um, to have your lessons in those big halls and get used to them, right? That's like unheard of. It's where do you get to do that? At DePaul, you get to do that. Thank you so much for doing this interview with us today, Jeff. Thank you so much for your time. It's been so wonderful learning more about you. And, you know, we're so fortunate to learn about your experiences and what inspired you and just to be able to see our faculty and what brought them to DePaul and what their journey was. It's so wonderful, and we're so fortunate to have you. Thank you so much. And this has been an honor for me to get to talk to you. And we don't get to talk like this in lessons. So this is terrific to, to sit down and chat this way. So thank you for, for your wonderful, inquisitive questions and, um, and the way that you've handled all this. Wonderful. America, I give.